In this demonstration, we're going to show you how to create an editable table. So the first step is to create a regular table. We have a business object here for employees. We'll just drag and drop it on the page and just create a regular table. We'll pick the fields that we want to uh, allow people to look at or edit. In our case, it's mostly the name and the salary. I also have here the ID, um, which is useful in some cases. And then you can set some properties on the table. For example, you probably want to set the height of the table. If you have a lot of records, this would enable you to do pagination of data, um, which is important, so not to fetch all the data initially. And the other thing that you probably want to set for the table, if you want it to be editable, is the um, edit mode. Okay, so um, the edit mode would be row edit. So this would allow you to double click on a record and edit it. So if you double click on it, it would go into edit mode. But right now, we don't have an actual editable component in here. So the next step is to bring in some editable component and replace the fields that are currently being shown. So I'm going to take an input text component and drag and drop it to place it on top of the name field, then remove the label and also make it so it's not just read only, so we can edit it. Uh, similarly, we can look up for the input number and drag and drop it over here. Again, removing the label and making sure that it's not read only. Now that we have those components, we actually don't want to always show them. We want to show them only if we are in an edit mode. Okay? Otherwise, we want to show regular text. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you that in the code view, but you can also do this basically from the structure pane uh, over here. You can right click on a component and say surround with an if. Okay. And then the condition in which we're going to show this specific input component is going to be if the mode of the row right now is edit. Okay. So current.mode equals to edit. And if it's edit, we're going to show the input field. And we're going to do the same thing for the salary input number field. So again, right click, choose surround with, and use the same condition, basically, like that. All right, so this is what we're going to show in an edit mode. If it's not edit mode, we want to show regular text. So let's copy this OJ bind if section and place it over here. This time we'll switch the condition to be if it's not edit, okay? And we're going to look up regular text, drag and drop it into the area here. And this would actually create a field that is already mapped to the current data. You can now remove the input field from this one. And now you have two ways to show the field depending on the mode. And we're going to repeat exactly the same steps over here for the um, input uh, number. Okay, so again, take the OG bind if, switch it to the opposite, and bring in a text in here, and remove the input component. All right, so let's go back um, into the visual view. You can format the code like that. And in the visual view, if we now go into live mode and we click to edit, we are now in a mode where we can edit the record like that. Now, what you see is that when we leave the record, we lose the data that was in there. So one of the things we want to do is we want to keep the data that is being changed. So to do that, what we're going to define is a new variable to hold that data. We'll start though by defining a type. The type is going to be based on our endpoint. Um, so an endpoint, for example, that returns a single employee. I'm going to pick up the fields that we're using. So name, salary, and ID. And we're going to give it a name to the type. I'm going to call it an employee type. And now that we have the type, we can go over and create a variable from that type. So I'm going to call it current row. You might want to use another name. Current row might be a little confusing later on, but in this example, I'm using current row. Again, it's based on this type, so it has those variables or those attributes, actually. Okay. 
So now we can go over back to our page and for each one of the input component, we're going to map it instead of to the current row, we're going to map it to the current row variable that we defined. So current row variable and the name in this case. And over here, the same thing for a salary. Instead of to the current data, we're going to map this one to the current current row variable salary. Okay. So, so far we worked on the table, we defined the field and the variable to hold the updated value. But what we want to work with is a buffer data provider. So what we're going to do now is go back to the variables and define a new variable. We'll give it a name in our case, amp BDP. And this is going to be of the type of buffering data provider. So this variable is going to be based on the SDP. So for the data provider that is the base for this, we're just going to drag over the name of the SDP that is populating our table. This way we populate the BDP with the data and we map the two together. And then we can go back to the table definition and instead of having it based on the SDP, we're going to base it on the BDP and specifically on the instance attribute of the BDP. As you can see, you don't actually see any change in the UI, it still looks the same. Now, if you now go into live mode and you click to edit the record, what we're showing you here is this current row variable that we defined, which right now is empty. So you don't see any values. So what we need to do is on the table, when we click to edit, we need to assign a value into this current row variable. Okay, so we're going to take the before a row edit, and in here we're going to use an assign variable action, and into the current row variable, we're going to take the actual um, row data that is an input that we get into this action. So now if we switch back to live, double click to edit, now we have the values in here and we can edit them. All right, so this allows us to have a mode where we can go in and modify the data. The next thing we want to do is what happens when we finish editing the data. So when we finish to editing the data and we leave the row, we have an action here. Uh, it's the row end edit end event. What we're going to do is we're going to add one more input parameter to this action chain. Okay, and we'll call it the change draw, and it's going to be of the type employee type that we defined before. So we now need to set a value for this. So we're going to go to the event listener right here. And you can see this is not mapped right now. So we're going to click on it and we're going to assign into it the value from our current row variable that we defined. Nice. So now in our action chain, if we go back to our action chain, we have access to the current row data. It's in the changed record. And we're going to use the call variable on our BDP and invoke a method called update item on it. There's an item structure that you need to pass with the key and with the data. And again, the data is going to be this change draw variable that we just defined for our action chain. Okay. So what this does is basically tells the BDP, hey, here's a record that you need to track. Okay, like that. All right. And it has the key for the row as well as the data itself. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add a save button uh, up here, for example. And over here, you're going to do whatever type of processing you need to do on the data that was changed. Okay. In our case, we want this button to only be available after you finished editing a row. Okay. So I'm going to define a Boolean variable over here that is mapped to the disabled and um, by default, this would be true. So we're going to set the variable default value to be true. In this way, the save button is disabled until you actually exit a row that you edited. Okay. So now in the action chain that actually uh, finishes 
editing. Okay, we're going to add an assign variable step and set this disable to be false. Okay, so we exit the editing mode and the button becomes enabled. It's no longer disabled. Then we switch to the start of the edit. When we start the edit, we're going to again use an assign variable and set the disable to be true because while we're editing a row, we don't want someone to click push before we finished editing the row. So you can see the behavior right now, disabled, modify some data, it's still disabled, but the minute that you um, go out of the editing mode like this, it becomes enabled. Okay. So this is the behavior we want for the save button in order to make sure that it's only invoked at the right time. Now let's add logic to this button. We're defining an event when we click the button. And we're going to start by defining a local variable um, just by typing the name. In our case, it's going to be the changed records and it's going to be an array of the records that have been changed. We initialize it with an empty array like that. Then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to invoke a method on our BDP. So we're going to use the call variable action map it to the BDP, and we're going to call the method called get all submitted items. So this returns an array of all the rows that were changed. We're going to store it into a variable. I give it a name here, for example, changed. And then we're going to take and assign into our changed record the value that was returned from the previous step, which is changed. Okay, you won't see it over here, but you can just type the value. If you switch to the code view, you basically are doing a simple assignment here of one variable into the other. Now the changed record is a variable, an array that we can loop over. So we're going to use a for each um, action and map it to be based on our changed records array. And we have an item in here for each row that we're going through, and we can do something for each row. And specifically what we're going to do is we're going to use a call rest action to call the rest endpoint that updates an employee. Okay, so this would be the patch operation. Patch operation needs the ID of the employee. Okay, so we need to assign a value to that one. Uh, you can click on it and assign a value. What I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to type something in here and I'm going to do the assignment actually in the code view and I'm going to do the same thing for the body. So I'm just putting placeholders right here. Okay. And then if you switch to the code view, you would actually see the values here. And then you can go get things like code insight over here. So instead of uh, bringing in the ID, Inside the loop, we have this item, and inside the item, there's another item, and inside it, there's data, and then in our case, there's the ID of the employee, okay? Uh, for the body, we just need the item.item.data, which is the full record. And by the way, if you don't know how to find this out, you can set a breakpoint here in your code, debug it, and see the variable that is inside the loop that is available for you called item. All right, so at this stage, we have a loop that basically patches all our employees when we update something. So if we go and do an inspect here, just to show you um, what's going on behind the scene. Again, in the console, you'll be able to see all the uh, action chains that are activated. Um, as you click, for example, we invoke one. We're going to change a couple of records here. And then when we leave it, we now have the save button available for us. And we can click the save button to actually do the updates into the backend. So calling the rest services. If you look at the network tab, you can see the two calls that we did with the patch operation and the payload that we um, passed to each one of those. Again, as you develop this, it's probably not going to be that trivial. You might want to set breakpoints in your code. So um, that's pretty easy to do now with the JavaScript action chain. You go over, you locate your action chain uh, over here. Remember that the action chain needs to be invoked first in order to be available here. 
So for example, here's the action chain for the save button, and you can set breakpoints um, to examine, for example, the values of variable, the structure of them, things like that. And so this is very useful while you're developing to help you figure out if something goes wrong or is not working as expected, um, which probably would happen if you're using a different names than what I'm using here. You can see we're hitting the breakpoint and then you can hover over items and see, for example, the item and the structure. There's the key over here, which is actually the ID. It's useful. There's the data inside an item. And in the data, you can see the different fields for the record that you're currently on. Those are the fields that we're using over here when we're passing it to the patch operation. It will clear our breakpoint. One more thing we need to do after we completed submitting stuff. Uh, we want to call a method on the BDP to remove any items we haven't submitted. So on the BDP, there's a method called reset all unsubmitted items. Okay. And we also want before that to actually refresh our SDP and get the updated data to be reflected there and in the BDP. So I'm going to pick up the SDP, invoke the refresh event on it. This would also update the BDP. And now if we basically go back to our application in live mode and we'll just update some data here, kind of resetting the demo with... Um, proper names and the salary over here. Okay. If we now click the save button, this would update the data, refetch, and we got the updated data in our editable table.